Good morning, everybody. Hello, my name's Jules, and I am the speaker liaison for ICAD London this year. Um, I'd like to, it's my greatest pleasure this morning to introduce um, Paula Hall. Uh, Paula is the clinical director of the Laurel Centre and one of Europe's leading experts in sex and porn addiction and a highly experienced couples counsellor, sex and addictions therapist. Paula is the author of Understanding and Treating Sex and Pornography Addiction, Sex Addiction, The Partner's Perspective, and most recently, Sex Addiction, A Guide for Couples. Today, the theme of Paula's presentation is Can Relationships Survive Sex Addiction? A hugely important topic of discussion that will help people understand the impact that sex and porn addiction has on couples and relationships. This presentation will give particularly therapists the tools to be a guide on people's journey in recovery. I'd like to thank you all for being here and Paula, it's over to you. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, looks like we've got a, a sudden last minute rush, so uh, shall I just let people settle before I start? Can you hear me okay? Yeah? There's a queue at the door. It's a sudden rush. Okay, bolt to the doors. <laughs> Don't let them out. Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. So um, I think I've got an hour to talk about whether or not relationships can survive sex addiction. Um, the, sh the short answer is yes, they can. Um, but... But boy, is it hard work. Um, I trained with Relate uh, 28 years ago, so I've been a couple counsellor for 28 years, then became a sex therapist, then specialised in sex addictions, and been working in this for about 12 years now. So I've been a couple counsellor for a heck of a long time, and I can honestly tell you, this is the hardest work I have ever done, is working with couples where there is sex addiction. It is the all the worst stuff of finding out that your partner is somebody with an addiction that you're going to have as a partner you're going to have to live with as well so you're going to be living with somebody in recovery for the rest of your life well hopefully you are in as much as they're not going to relapse so you'll always be with somebody who's in recovery but also you've got all the betrayal so all the issues that come up with an affair with infidelity, but with the very real possibility of further slips and relapses. And um, for many partners, the idea that there may be another slip is quite different from somebody in an affair situation, might you be unfaithful again? And when you've you know, potentially got all the, um, all the context that we have around addiction, where we talk about it being a chronic, chronically, persistently, whatever it is, relapsing condition, that's hardly comforting to a partner who might be deciding to, to stay in the relationship. So, yes, my latest book... So this, I've, now, I've now done the trilogy, which is quite exciting. So this is, um, some of you may know the old brown book that I wrote. So this is the second edition. So when I was here speaking last year, I was talking about this second edition that had just come out. So this is kind of the one for the person with the addiction. This is the one for the partner. And then this is the new one, which is the guide for couples and for people who work with them. So it's kind of a complete set now. So I'm, I'm now done writing for a while. Uh, these are for sale on the bookstall out there and also on our stand in the main hall. So let me start by... Um, I'm going to explain this book cover because this is not accidental. So as I started... Um, thinking about how to structure this book and how to write it the, the, my mind works in metaphors, it's just the way it's wired up um, the, the image I got was that if you think of the relationship as a 
ship, so relationships, it also fitted rather nicely. <laughs> it's clever, eh? Um, so you've got the relationship, sex addiction or porn addiction is the tidal wave that hits it. And it really is a tidal wave. Now, obviously, it isn't for everybody. For some people, I, you know, addiction isn't just black and white, is it? I mean, there are different degrees of it. And certainly the, uh, there are different degrees of it as far as partners are concerned. Somebody with a mild pornography addiction, it may be quite different for the couple relationship to recover from that than somebody who's actually been, you know, multiple affairs and sex workers for the last 20 years of your 18 year relationship. That's gonna be quite different. So there's the tidal wave that hits the boat and throws everybody overboard. So you'll, you'll see how this metaphor kind of works through as I explain this, this three stage model. So why does sex addiction hurt so much? I've already said a bit about that. It absolutely wrecks trust. Um, and it's, for the partner, we've just started a partner group in London um, just this week. For the partner, it's not just the trust in their other half. Um, I hate that expression. I can't believe I've just used it, their other half. Anyway, apologies. Um, it's not just their, that it's broken their trust with that person, but it's actually the trust within themselves. So one partner, she's been with him since she was 17 years old, and she's now <coughs> 51, 52. And this addictive behaviour of some sort or another, and particularly now around sex and porn, has been going on for nearly 20 years. And she had absolutely no idea. Absolutely no idea. So her ability to trust her own instincts, her own reality, is also completely shot. She also had no idea that some of these things in pornography and some of the text messages that she found... Um, she, uh, her words, I didn't know it was physically possible, let alone that people actually paid for it. Mm -hmm. So, just not understanding this world that she lives in. So it's not just the trust within the relationship, it's trust within the individual. And also I think often the side that we don't talk about is how much sex addiction wrecks the trust of the person with the addiction. Because often the person with the addiction is saying, do I, can I really love my partner and do this? Maybe I don't. And as it starts escalating more and more, and we know that's what happens with addiction, their trust in their own um, experience of the relationship begins to change. Well, maybe I'm just in the wrong relationship. Maybe I shouldn't be in a relationship. Maybe, maybe I'm just like that. I'm just why. So they lose trust in themselves as well. Um, we know that um, staggered dis disclosure, it's pretty rare for a partner to find out all at once. Generally, it's a, a drip, drip disclosure, so all exposure, finding out gradually more and more. And then there's those conversations late into the night. Have you told me everything? I swear on our children's lives, I have told you everything until the next thing that they find out a few weeks later. Partners' skills at investigation are phenomenal absolutely phenomenal the way they manage to be suddenly become IT experts going from not being able to you know put a DVD on or find Netflix to actually being able to <laughs> one partner said to me the other day um, she just she she um, she does do a bit of uh, computer work anyway she wrote a program so even though he had wiped everything from his laptop completely no history at all she wrote a short program um, because he's got an, an Apple Mac, would link to his iPhone to find every single phone call and message he'd ever sent or received in the time that he's had an iPhone, which is about four years. And she's, I just wrote a little program for that and it just churned out all the data on a spreadsheet. So a lot of this, of course, the, the, this addiction is facilitated by the internet, but actually discovery is often can be facilitated by that as well. Uh, the secrecy and the shame, of course, is what wrecks it. And um, I think for many partners, and then this came up in the group that I was running on Thursday, it's, it's, it's the lies, it's the deceit that is more damaging than the actual behaviour. The, yes, the behaviours, you know, for, for some that's very difficult and it damages their self-esteem and so on and so forth. Um, but it really is the deceit and the betrayal and the barefaced eyeball to eyeball lies that are very difficult to manage um, and the social stigma as well partners feel very isolated so we know that the person with the addiction does and th there are still so many people who say you know I could cope with any addiction apart from this one 
Um, I'm working with one guy at the moment. So exactly, he's we've been working together for quite a long time. He has only just decided this definitely is an addiction. Just getting through that denial has been so difficult because he has kept saying, "But, but surely this is just what people do." And the thought of having to accept that actually maybe this is an addiction has, has been really difficult for him. But for partners, yeah, if he was an alcoholic, if he was a drug addict, if he was anything else, people would support me, people would understand, but not this one. Um, someone else recently said that she had told her friend and she had been hugely supportive um, but then a few weeks later her husband who's the person with the addiction was going to be picking up their children from school and the primary school aged children and she said actually if do you mind I'd really rather he wasn't didn't see my children anymore I want to support you you know obviously I'll be there and support you but I'd rather <coughs> your husband didn't go anywhere near my children that's pretty tough pretty tough so yeah well that says it really the misunderstanding so um I really liked this image. Um, I did another talk recently and I talked about how working with couples is, with sex addiction is a nightmare. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, working with couples with sex addiction is a nightmare. And the reason for that is, you know, those of you that work in, in recovery will know this, that the person getting into recovery from the addiction is often waking from a living nightmare. That is often how they will describe it. As they get more and more into recovery, they are waking from a living nightmare. Finally, they get out of the grips of addiction and they get their life back. They begin to start enjoying other things in life. They break out of the bubble. The scales have fallen from their eyes. All those wonderful things we hear working with people who are getting, really getting into recovery. They are waking from a living nightmare. For the partner, it's the start of it. So for the partner who has just found out about all this, this is the start of the nightmare. Uh, one guy, so I did some um, research for the book and I put a quote in the introduction because one guy just worded it so brilliantly. And uh, what he said was, I gained my freedom at the cost of hers. And that is exactly what happened. So as a couple counsellor, you are working with somebody who is going through a process of grief and mourning and loss and trauma and somebody who's yay getting into recovery has found freedom yes there might be these slips and cognitive distortions and all that stuff unfortunately but but basically you have got and when i trained with the relate they said you cannot work with a split agenda you cannot work with a split agenda you could not have a more split agenda than this and often, of course, the person with the addiction is, right, I'm in recovery now, so you know everything that's happened, so let's move on. Let's get on. I'm really ready to commit to this relationship now fully and actually start rebuilding our relationship. Back to the, uh, the, the metaphor of the, soon, um, the tidal wave, she's still drowning in the water and the idea that actually we're just going to rebuild this. At least kind of in the rowing boat. Come on, in you get. It's going to be great. It's not where she is at all. So let me just put, highlight some key differences to affairs. Um, I spend a lot of my time doing talks either to um, relationship therapists and sex therapists or addiction therapists. Um, you guys know probably more than certainly the other group do the difference between somebody with an addiction and someone where it's an affair. But sometimes couple counsellors still think, well, this is infidelity, I can work with it. It is completely different. Because in, infidelity is the bread and butter of couple work. Um, it's often more challenging to values, and I don't just mean because of the types of behaviours, although that may be part of it. Um, but I think we, we kind of have a social construct and context of infidelity, yeah? You, any Hollywood movie, soap opera, in, in, anything that's on telly, on the radio, in the news, you can't open a newspaper without somebody having had an affair. We've kind of got a context, right? we get it, we understand it. If your partner's had an affair, or you've had an affair, painful, difficult, obviously not saying it's okay, but you know you're one of a heck of a lot of people that do it. Can't remember what the statistics are now, but it's, it's pretty high statistics. Um, whereas addiction, is, sex addiction particularly, is still something we don't talk about as much. There is no before to get back to. 
Um, one of the there's a few questions I would absolutely recommend you never say or yeah, not until you really know the couple very very well and one is how was your relationship when you first got together if you're working with infidelity that would be a pretty standard question how was your relationship when you got together the other one is how's your sex life don't ask that um, but often there is no before for in, in my experience for the vast majority of partners they've been with somebody with a sex addiction f long before they got into the relationship the addiction nearly always goes back to adolescence and predates it so how was it when you first got together the answer is going to be don't know ask him it was completely different from what I thought I thought we were happy I thought everything was fine I thought we had a good relationship apparently not um, and similarly with sex if you ask how the sexual relationship was often the sexual relationship may be brilliant and it really has been completely split off the acting out um, it may have been challenging um, it may um, see this a lot it may have been the person with the addiction who has withdrawn from the sexual relationship often the partner has wanted a more you know a more active sex life but it's been split off elsewhere so they've had a miserable sex life and boy do they get angry about that they've had a miserable sex life for years while they've been gallivanting around having a great time if you work with a person with the addiction you know they're not gallivanting around having a great time but that is the partner's perspective initially it may never be over so when you're working with infidelity you're talking about a fair proofing your relationship wouldn't it be great if you could addiction proof a relationship if you could addiction proof anything um, but it may never be over helping partners understand you will always be living with someone in recovery the roles your, so if you're going to rebuild your relationship and you're going to set sail again, your roles will be completely different. You will always be a partner who has survived this level of infidelity. You will always be living with someone with an addiction. For the person with the addiction, you will always have an addiction and you will always be in recovery. Always. The shame... I don't um, I think critically it's not a symptom of a problem within the relationship so if you're working in general um, couple psychotherapy then we talk about infidelity often as being a symptom of a problem within the relationship sometimes it's a symptom of a problem within the individual but generally it's something to do with the collusive fit of the couple y usually you're looking sort of there for, for, the, for where it's began and then therefore what needs to be fixed to, to a fair proof the relationship addiction absolutely belongs to the person with the addiction now that's not to say that the relationship may not have been a contributing factor and that can be very challenging for partners um, but clearly if you have an addiction whatever kind of addiction is if you also have a rubbish relationship for whatever reason that's not saying it's not your own fault it's rubbish as well then that's going to contribute to the problem but it's not, the relationship itself is not the cause. And I have had clients say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. And I said, for goodness sake, just divorce. That's what people do. If it was that bad, why did you just end it? Just end it, I don't know what's happening. So powerlessness. So say something about three legs of recovery. So um, the addict, of course, needs to get into recovery. Oh, sorry. Click away. Um, you know all that stuff they need to establish their own sobriety identify their causes and triggers commit to relapse prevention and repair their self identity and get an external support structure um, for partners to recover for sure one of the things they often need to know is why 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 did you do this why I don't understand why 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 and until the person with the addiction has got some level of recovery it's often really difficult to answer that. They will continue to come up with things like, I was bored, it was there, or I don't know, is the most common response, which is not at all helpful. Uh, the partner, regardless of what's gonna to happen to the um, relationship and re regardless of whether or not the addict's getting into recovery, needs to survive the trauma. They need to assess their own reality, establish their balance and stability, develop their own psychological safety strategies and repair self-identity and get their own external support structure see a lot of part couples particularly those that are a bit enmeshed who want to do recovery together 
And in my experience, that just does not work. They want to do all of the recovery as a couple. And I really firmly believe that if you agree to do it in that way, then you're kind of, you're colluding with the idea that this addiction is a part of the relationship. And I don't think it is. It is to do with the person with the addiction. I think also, critically, you can't be 100% sure, not that you ever can, um, that he is disclosing everything. So often, unless he's, I say he, it's, in my experience, it's nearly, I nearly work <coughs> entirely with male addicts, not in, always, but yeah, predominantly I do. Um, if he hasn't got his own um, place to really talk about his recovery and what's going on, then often there are still secrets, and you know you're only as sick as your secrets. So the partner needs their support, the addict needs their support, then the couple can really start rebuilding. Um, I think there needs to be a shared understanding of the addiction. There's one couple I know who are kind of floating around, have been for some years, I've, they've, they've worked with everybody. Um, and um, the, the problem is she doesn't believe sex addiction really exists, it's just an excuse. He's committed to 12 step, he's committed to the program, he's doing well, she doesn't believe it's a real thing. I just don't see where that's gonna go, frankly. Uh, so they need to commit to each other's recovery, establish accountability, rebuild trust and intimacy, or hopefully have a healthy separation, and we'll talk about that a bit more. Is it all right so far? Yeah? Really good. Thank you. <laughs> so, key principles of couple recovery. And I find this quite useful to kind of help clients, you know, if this relationship is going to survive, and I think one of the first things you're doing is trying to slow things down. So um, I saw a couple um, last week, the baby's due in six weeks' time, which is an extra complication, could have done with that. She found out on Friday, that on Friday the week before, that this had happened. So she wants to know, and I understand where she's coming, I want to know everything that's happened, I want to know if you can get into recovery, I want to know if this relationship's going to survive, I want to know whether I can stay, and the baby's due in six weeks. And actually, I think often the first job is slowing everything down. God, there is no rush. And what I often say to partners is don't let the fact that he has monumentally, excuse my language, fucked up, force you to make a decision that you may, and your children, of course, may have to live with for the rest of your lives. His crisis does not mean you have to have one. You can take your time on this. And I think really empowering them that no decision is a decision, I think is really beneficial. But if they are going to recover, this is what will be required. They will need to blame the addiction and not each other. And I think that's a really key part of the work is separating the addiction out from them so that they can get on the same side of the table discussing the addiction rather than the addiction being something that's stuck between them, that they're fighting over. They've got to be on the same side of the table. They each accept responsibility for how they think, feel, and behave. This is true in any couple relationship, but the classic, you make me feel, doesn't work. I can't, rec oh, one couple, years ago this was, she couldn't stop drinking because he was a sex addict and he couldn't stop visiting prostitutes because she was an alcoholic. Brilliant. I just gave up after a while. I tried that, and it's okay. You've got the perfect couple fit for your addiction in actual fact. Perfect. So you've got to accept responsibility for how they think, feel and behave individually. They need to accept responsibility for meeting their own recovery needs and becoming happy and whole. So regardless of what the other does, they've got to take care of their own needs. They have support from others in their individual recovery. I know recovering from sex addiction um, you know, it can be very difficult, very challenging work and you know the people I work with absolutely deserve a pat on the back, a gold medal, a few stars, they do really well. You cannot expect your partner to give you a pat on the back for not shagging somebody else while you're away at the weekend. Yeah, Reaching basic minimum relationship requirements does not actually make partners go hooray for you, I'm so proud of you. But they do need that from somewhere. Uh, they support each other in their individual recovery, have issues quite often with partners saying, I don't want you going for therapy, I don't want you going to 12 step, you going to 12 step triggers me, therefore I don't want you to go to 12 step. Doesn't help. Uh, they empathise with each other, they respect each other, 
they're honest with each other, they give each other the benefit of the doubt, and I think that's important for all couple relationships, and they commit to rebuilding trust and developing deeper intimacy. Um, if I've got some, a couple in front of me and they're saying, I, you know, if we do stay together, I am never, ever, ever going to understand, ever. I am never, ever going to, um, forg- talk about the F word, forgiveness word, um, but I'm never, ever going to empathise with you. I'm never, ever, then actually, you might as well give up now, really. Who wants to live in that kind of relationship? Either of them. It's, it's crazy. So sometimes looking at this, this is the framework of what you'd need at some stage be helpful so stages of recovery so um, uh, Balcom and Snyder wrote a book and some papers um, wasn't that long ago a few years ago I ought to know can't remember Um, it's in the book Um, talking about stages of recovery for couples in infidelity and it's one of the only models where there's been outcome measures (coughs) for its efficacy in working with couples with um, where there's been affairs and I've, I've a real fan of um, outcome measures. Boring. Um, and so what I've done in, in, in the book is, is actually uh, uh, adapt their model to work with people, with couples with sex addiction. So stage one, impact. That is the tidal wave hitting the boat. First thing you've got to do is get back to shore. And that is often where actually trying to get back to shore together whilst holding hands and swimming is going to be pretty tricky. You need to take responsibility for yourself to get yourself back to some kind of safety and stability. And as a couple counsellor, that is the stage where they are often having a breakdown of some sort. That might be rage and anger. It might genuinely be a breakdown. I've worked with a number of couples where there, there's significant suicide risk for one or the other, um, or both sometimes. And you know, you're just trying to put out the fire, you're just trying to help them get some stability. And I think trying to, to go further along at this stage, which partners might want um, or couples might want you to do, isn't helpful. So, first of all, is the impact get back to safety. Second stage, meaning. So, back to the boat metaphor tidal waves hit the boat, they're back on shore. Next thing you've got to do is get that boat back to harbour and actually have a look at the damage. Let's actually see how seriously damaged this boat is. So um, we'll talk about disclosure um, a little bit later, so really (coughs) understanding what has happened. But it's also about how strong was our relationship in the first place? We really did need to replace that hull. That's been dodgy for years. And we, you know, the the mast, I don't know that much about boats, uh, the mast has been broken or had a crack in it for a long time. We really need to do that. And that was there long before the tidal wave hit it. It's always been there. So being able to have an honest assessment of the state of the relationship and seeing um, if there's anything left worth saving. And you know, some people are like, you know what, I've always hated this relationship. I went off it years ago. I want a new one. In which case, fine, end. Um, but really having an honest and I think one of the the challenges in this work as well is that so often what happens when couples hit a crisis like this is all of their attachment stuff gets triggered of course and they start clinging on to each other and it is they're they're like you know hanging on to to them as a, a sort of life raft but actually once they start getting some safety and stability back themselves they then go oh actually I'm not sure about this and that is just as often the addict as it is the partner. And the addict often feels huge guilt that the partner has stayed with them, but actually they want to leave. And sometimes, of course, the relationship has been a symptom of the addiction. They, may, they often got into that relationship as an addict. When they get into recovery, it may be that actually this isn't right for them. That's really tough. Um, so assess the damage of the relationship. The final stage is moving on, rebuilding the relationship through trust building, deepening intimacy and improved resilience, or it might be moving on apart. So maybe moving on together or it may be moving on apart. The key thing here, so I find this really helpful to talk through this model with clients pretty much from the start, because often the person with the addiction wants to do three. They want to move on now. Yeah, let's leave this in the past behind and get on my recovery. I'm doing really well. I want to do that. They want to move on now. But say, actually, the partner's still very much in the impact phase. 
You may have got back to shore and you're standing there happy as Larry. Come on, keep swimming, come on, we can start rebuilding. But actually, that's not what's happening yet. We have got to do it in this order. And I think just give, and I think it's really important as the couple counselor in these situations, you've got to hold the structure and you've got to hold the boundaries. And boundaries are often very difficult for people with suffering trauma and people with an addiction. But holding this structure can really help give them a sense of safety and stability in themselves. Oh, 2011. There you go, put the reference on. So, in the impact stage, some of the tasks. If I'm going a bit fast, it's because I want to try and make sure we've got some time for questions, okay? Um, first and foremost, commit to self-care. And, of course, the classic thing will be, I can't get into recovery in, unless I know my partner's okay and that they're going to stay with me. Or, I, you know, unless he's in recovery, I can't get better. Unless I know he's definitely never going to relapse again. They're never going to know that. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Comes up on here first. Um, th then I, yeah, then, then I can't recover from the trauma. Well, you, you've got to look after yourself first. And I think that's why they need to do their individual work. So at the Laurel Centre, we do do the work for the person with the addiction, the work for the partners and the couple. And it's pretty rare to take on a couple unless they're doing the work somewhere else. It doesn't have to be with us, of course, but unless they're doing it somewhere else. Um, look after family. So I'm also a family uh, trained family therapist. Don't do much of that these days, but trained family therapist. And I do think, as you know, as counsellors, we have got a responsibility to other family members. I think if you know they've got children, then you need to check how they're getting to school. You need to check where they are when they're having these huge arguments and the rants and the raves. Uh, be aware of domestic violence and abuse in these situations as well. And um, I think it's something guys often find very, very difficult to talk about, um, or they'll do it rather jokingly. Oh, she absolutely, we hear it in group a lot, oh, she absolutely went for me, blimey, fists were flying, went for me. And just kind of laugh it off and think, gosh, if this was the other way around, if this was a group of women, oh, he went for me, fists flying, we'd be phoning the police. I don't think we take it seriously enough, it's still abuse, and also next time she might have the Le Creuset saucepan in her hand. Mm -hmm. be a very posh form of domestic abuse, <laughs> wouldn't it? Le Creuset. Let me go and get the Le Creuset. Sorry. Um, but yeah, I think we've got a responsibility to ask those questions and be aware of what's happening for children as well. <coughs> um, establish accountability. I'm not going to go into that, but there, there's loads of stuff in the book about how to help couples establish accountability. Um, a, a couple I'm working with at the moment, so trying to help them to see that actually accountability is for both of their benefits yeah accountability can help lead to build trust it's not the same as monitoring and I'm saying to him why on earth would you want her to worry and just give you absolute hell when you could just have a tracker and you wouldn't have to explain where you've been because you can see Although they do sometimes go wrong but that's I can tell you a funny story about that anyway um, minimize conflict so that's all your couple counseling skills coming in to stop them killing each other agree check-in so this is really about so it tends to be all over the place at first um, so I usually suggest that right how many how often do you need to talk about this do you need to talk about it every day in which case put an hour I think an hour absolute maximum aside every day to talk about it but you don't talk about it outside of that hour is it one hour three times a week is it one hour once a week and it's going to depend where they're at but this is about getting some kind of containment so if you have a thought if something comes up outside of that time make a note right want to raise that and have a check-in so sit down once a week at least uninterrupted have a check-in how are you feeling how's your recovery going have we got anything coming up on the accountability contract that's creating an issue have a have a board meeting about it and and contain it to those times and it just allows them to relax a bit more outside of those sessions meaning stage tasks therapeutic disclosure so I'm going to talk about that a little bit more um, assessing the relationship there are loads of different uh, relationship assessment tools um, a lot of them I put in the book we then do something called emotional impact letter so basically what I used to do for for quite a few years was just do therapeutic disclosure and then that was it and I was quite aware that there'd be a bit after the therapeutic disclosure 
there'd be a bit of a sort of, right, well, so that's that done. And I used to feel a bit like, it's such a huge thing to do and I'm not really sure, it doesn't feel like there's a proper full stop. So now that there's other stages in the process, it works much better. Um, so after a therapeutic disclosure letter, I will talk a bit more about that. The partner can write an emotional impact letter. This is the impact it's had on me. Following that, the person with the addiction can write a rescue, and that basically is acknowledging the emotional impact letter. Then they, um, the addict writes a addiction explanation letter. I know it's hard to explain addiction, but partners often are still stuck with, I don't understand why, I don't understand why. And I find this, this is really, really helpful for the, the addicted partner, because often it's been a process of therapy that it's come out, and actually putting it down in one place, this is why I became an addict, this is why it happened, is, is a really useful exercise for them. Um, and I think the other thing you have to, to remember with co these couples is that they've often had a lot of these conversations, but it's often been at two o'clock in the morning, um, it's often been after a, a one, two, three bottles of wine. Uh, it's been highly emotional and they forget. And so often you hear, I told you that, I told you that the other day. And they just forget. There's so much emotion going around that they forget. So this kind of formalises a lot of the conversations that they've perhaps had into one place and I do I, I really do believe that there is something about putting something down on paper having it there which gets it out and is quite containing then the partner would would write an acknowledgement letter <laughs> negotiate boundaries that is so a whole other topic in itself so we just skip past that <laughs> okay um, <laughs> oh, couples and boundaries um, therapeutic disclosure does everybody know what I mean by therapeutic disclosure not necessary. Okay. Um, so, therapeutic disclosure is a process with a therapist for basically saying, explaining the tidal wave that hits you. Because partners will continue. How many sex workers did you see? Where did you see them? Did you ever take anybody back to this? Which hotel chains did you go to? Which? What sexual? Da, da, da. Have you ever done this? Have you ever done that? And it would be endless and endless and endless. And they want to know, often they want to know everything, and I think knowing details, graphic details that build images, not helpful at all. Although one partner recently found out because she set up a video camera. Mm. Very cunningly, she set up a video camera so she could play the video of the threesome, foursome, awesome, uh over and over again, which she had a tendency to do, which of course was not terribly helpful for her recovery. Um, but yeah, graphic information is often not helpful, but they need to know basically what's happened. And you know, you're only as sick as your secrets. And I say to the guys, do you want her to be staying with you based on the truth or because of what she thinks you are and what she thinks you did? Do you want to spend the rest of your life wondering if they, your partner would have stayed if they'd known dot, dot, dot? Get it out now. So it's a therapeutic process, so it's done with a therapist, basically you have a session with a partner saying what do you know, what questions have you got, you draft that out, session with the person with the addiction, right, these are all the questions, anything else, from that they write a therapeutic disclosure letter, you then have a couple session, the letter is read out to the partner and then hopefully that's a line in the sand. It is never that smooth by the way, if only, but there you go. Um, so it draws a line under the information seeking and sharing process. So it is, this is the damage that it's caused our relationship. It allows both to remember and acknowledge what was shared during earlier emotionally charged disclosures, provides a safe space to process any additional information that may be revealed. Classic thing that, the, the other reason you're doing it is, I think I might have said this further along, um, is to ensure that the couple counselling process isn't sabotaged by a later revelation. And sometimes that later revelation is because it genuinely been forgotten or because you didn't ask or because I didn't know it was important. An example of this is, did you act out while I was pregnant? 
that can be absolutely gutting for a lot of partners that while I was pregnant you were sleeping with sex workers that is the question for the therapist to ask have you have you asked this I hate doing therapeutic disclosures because partners are already in pain and then you say by the way have you asked whether or not he acted out when I was, you were pregnant oh he wouldn't do that oh gosh no he wouldn't do that you wouldn't would he don't know but the point is to get that information out now not when you thought you were moving on in six months 12 months two years time uh, ensures an equal relationship without secrets where both parties know what happens allows decisions to be made about the future based on truth creates greater opportunities for intimacy to grow from shared knowledge of the past a, client, a colleague of mine, Nick, um, he refers to it as he says to the guys, if you don't share everything, you'll be spending the rest of your life on a witness protection program. Yeah? You will never know when it might come out. Boy, again. I know one guy, um, it, it was quite a while afterwards, he, his partner knew that he'd got a profile online and gone on all these um, adult sites and dating sites he swore he'd never met anybody he'd met quite a few um, his business he was an entrepreneur business was going really well he was invited to go on dragon's den he turned it down it was an amazing opportunity he turned it down because there was no way he because basically he was he would meet numerous people have great sex and then never contact them again ever he could to be on television named. He just could not risk it coming out, and that was, uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, I've I've never seen his thing that he created out in the general domain, so I suspect that completely wrecked his career. Anyway, uh, provides information from which the accountability contract can be strengthened. Um, if if you've lied about what you used to do, it's so much easier not to be accountable for it. And you know this with people with addiction just not mentioning something just creates a lovely loophole to continue acting out in a certain way. Well, I didn't lie because I never told you in the first place. Um, so that's all part of um, creating the meaning of what has actually happened to this relationship. So say a bit about the moving on stage tasks. So you need to acknowledge and accept new rules. What is recovery? What does it look like? What does it mean to be a partner with somebody who's in recovery? What will staying in recovery mean? Um, I, you know, so many couples hope they can put this behind them and it will be the end. But actually, you're going to be in recovery forever. How are you going to continue your recovery? And that means partners are always going to be reminded each 12-step meeting, each, you know, whatever it is, that's another reminder that they're in recovery and that can be tough. Um, and partners often have triggers for years and years to come. Something will remind them. Um, I know there's one partner, she can't stay in travel lodges. No, it's Premier Inns, Premier Inns, because when the um, new advert comes on the telly for Premier Inn, she always ends up bursting into tears. So and it's not you know a Lenny Henry thing or whatever. It's because <laughs> he o he only ever used Premier Inns because he had a discount card thing. <laughs> so oh and yeah, I also knew this because um, we had a, we've got a Premier Inn just around the corner from our office where she came for one of our residential programs and don't put her in the Premier Inn. <laughs> um, overcome shame and blame. So obviously that's where forgiveness comes in. Rebuild trust. I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Deepen and develop intimacy. So Becoming Trustworthy is a very good book called Worthy of Her Trust by Stephen Auk, A-U-K. can't remember the rest. Worthy of Her Trust. Do you know what it is? Worthy of Her Trust, do you know that one? Stephen Anyway, do the book. Uh, proactive Honesty. Um, what we said you've got to start showing your workings out you say oh you know i've got a meeting tomorrow with uh, john and tim and i thought we might go to the uh, the pub at so and so uh, and yeah should be finished about three and then i just just that kind of chat say it out loud when you're thinking and planning and working things out say it out loud proactive honestly don't wait to be asked say where you're going what you're doing what's happening just get into the habit 
and we know that addiction is just you know just thrives in secrecy and so often lies are told about the daftest things it just becomes a habit to lie got to become proactively honest about everything be accurate i'll be going at roughly one o'clock to it'll be last i don't know approximately two hours i shouldn't be back much later than 11 not good enough got to be accurate T30 journal this is a re this this works really well for people who travel a lot basically you get a spreadsheet you say where you're going to be in 30 minutes chunks sounds arduous but it's really not it's 7:30 have breakfast 8 o'clock go to the venue so, so mine would be 9:30 do talk 10 o'clock do talk 10:30 take questions whatever I, it, every 30 minutes it's just going to say ICAD conference ICAD conference ICAD it's going to be repeated but it just gives a night if you've got a business schedule one client I've got it's so good for business as well I'm so much more organized than I ever was because I do a T30 journal and once you've got the template it's very easy technological transparency your phone is out face up all the time it never goes into the bathroom with you know the passcode it's always on ring just absolute technological transparency um, Apple you have all the family sharing on on all devices at all times which is often how guys be found out 10 minute rule if you've told me a lie you have 10 minutes to own up because it is so often automatic did you put the bin out yeah you got 10 minutes to go oh, oh, that was a lie I'm sorry I don't know why I said that I didn't put the rubbish out 10 minute rule Financial openness, knowing, you know, access to all accounts. <laughs> 24 hour uh, disclosure rule. You do have to discuss with couples um, what needs to be disclosed. Some partners want to know every single time they're triggered. And I say, seriously, you do not want to know every time there's a trigger. When your mum walks in and looks particularly hot that day and is triggered, you don't want to know that. Nobody wants to know <coughs> that. You do not want to know every trigger. What you do want is commitment that you're working on those triggers, of course, that they're going to be worked on. But maybe slips? Don't know, what counts as a slip? YouTube dance videos? Uh, no, I don't need to know about that as long as it doesn't escalate from there. What is a slip? What is a relapse? That's going to depend on the type of behaviour, but it also depends couple to couple. So you're going to need to negotiate what will be disclosed. Some partners are, I need you to disclose if you've had a slip to somebody in the fellowship, to your therapist, and to do that within 24 hours. If it's beyond this, then I need disclosure within 24 hours and you need to tell me. So that's, that's going to vary. Openness to polygraphs. Um, we, we, we do do poly, we get someone in to do the polygraphs, we don't do them ourselves, obviously. Uh, so I, I think polygraphs can be really helpful. Polygraphs, the most useful intervention, so when we do a therapeutic disclosure, I will usually say, so when you've written that letter, so uh, will you be happy to do a polygraph on that? If they go, no, no way, absolutely no way, over my dead body, I think you've got your answer, <laughs> frankly, without taking a polygraph. If they go, yeah, absolutely, yeah, definitely, absolutely, definitely, don't mind doing a polygraph. Often, I'll say to couples, uh, they'll write it, read it, well, you could do the polygraph, but you know he was uh, willing to do it, so you could just save yourself 600 quid and go away somewhere nice at the weekend. It's not cheap, doing a polygraph. Um, but some couples do do the polygraph on the disclosure letter, and the, the question is normally, um, have you deliberately, knowingly, consciously left something out that is significant in this statement so it's not have you forgotten anything because you might have done yeah it's have you deliberately consciously i'm getting some of the words wrong i know the words are actually really important but it's something like that um some couples will do a re agree to do a polygraph test every six months have you acted out since the last polygraph it's a bit of insurance. I know they're a bit controversial, but as I say, it's the willingness to do them, which probably tells you more than the actual polygraph test. Um, really important to have no surprises. One poor, poor partner, poor, poor him. Um, it was her 40th birthday, so he planned a weekend away without her knowing. Uh, so he turned up to pick her up and take her away, and he'd done all, he'd arranged it all, you know, it was a surprise. 
she absolutely freaked out. What else have you been doing without me knowing? She had no idea that he was planning this and it just triggered everything. She went back to square one again. She was traumatised. But bless him, I could, yeah, the right intention. I'd move. Blocks to moving forward, unconscious collusions. Some couples need to keep fighting because it's the only way they have emotion within their relationship. That may have always been the case and this is just more grist to the mill. Unless they can work on those unconscious collusions that may have been around for a long time, they may not move forward. One very obvious unconscious collusion is where there's codependency, of course. So we generally never use the term codependency because it can be... Um, I, I mean, frankly, I, I don't like the term codependency. I think it's, um, t it doesn't really fit with sex and porn addiction because you can not know. Um, but also, it's just a very, very generic term for some kind of unconscious collusion. And as a couple of therapists, there's so many nuances to it. But yeah, unconscious collusions need to be worked on. Uh, significant previous issues within the relationship. Um, oh gosh, one partner I remember, she'd had an affair for quite a long standing affair some years before. He'd always had a bit of a porn issue, got the internet, whoosh, took off. After finding out about her affair, he started acting out. Didn't cause it, he could have made other choices, but he started acting out offline as well. As far as she was concerned, don't you ever bring my affair up after what you've done. He still had a lot of stuff that he needed to talk about her infidelity. As far as she was concerned, forget it. That's mm. nothing compared to what you've done. That was not going to work out. Relationship or sexual issues that have previously been hidden by the addiction. So, um, you know, just simple things like incompatibility, which you know, nobody really noticed because they weren't particularly close because mm. of the addiction. Refusal to commit to individual recovery. Um, so sometimes obviously that's the person with the addiction who's still in denial of it and saying that you know they're not going to get into recovery or refusing to be honest there's a couple I'm working with at the moment I'm not too sure where that's going to go because I just do not think he's just put, he's not really getting into recovery he's, he's paying lip service he's not going to meetings he's not he's not really doing it uh, but also see this where the partner is I will never ever ever let you forget what you've done to me ever you are always going to see what you've done to me. I will never let you forget. That's just not going to work. Non-forgiveness is similar. Kind of, but I think that is also true of not forgiving yourself. The person with the addiction who won't forgive themselves. And often, I remember one partner saying, I want my man back. And actually, what she'd ended up with was this little sort of puppy dog who was filled with shame and remorse and guilt. She said, I just want my man back forgive yourself what's the point of staying in this relationship if you won't forgive yourself and let it go I forgive you why can't you forgive yourself and of course sometimes that's an unconscious if I don't forgive myself I won't act out again it's trying to use non-forgiveness as a relapse prevention strategy it's it's not recovery shame blame fear and I think that's the fear that it'll, it'll happen again That's a bit more about what we do at the Laurel Centre. We've got a stand here, which I should have written on the slide. Can't remember what stand number it is. Anyway, we're in the big hall, knitting and coffee. And the books. Questions? Ooh, I think we're meant to finish at half past. We're meant to finish at half past or at 11? Half past. Half past. <laughs> Three minutes for any questions. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere afterwards, anyway. I'm not going to come on with our conference. Um, I would like to ask you, what do What generates the first tidal wave? I think the, the tidal wave is the discovery of the sex addiction. So I, I think, it, it, you know, using the boat metaphor, so you're on your relationship, there's two of you. He's got a secret in the hold that she's never known about. All the time she thought that they were on this nice relationship, or maybe not, maybe it was always a bit rocky, but he's had this secret in the hold that he's kept hidden for years and years and years. Fair, um, rarely self-disclosure only if so um, someone I know uh, self-disclosed because he just lost his job 
he lost his job because he was pulled up on a sexual harassment charge and everything else was likely to come out because very so he confessed because he just lost his job and it was going to be found out anyway but generally no it's usually partners have found out in my experience or they've caught an STI and it is a horrible way of finding out they've found out that way so uh, but yeah normally it's partners found yeah, out somehow yeah yeah Exactly the same, exactly the same. So we, we do, yeah, I'm very aware of being very heteronormative. Um, yeah, ex exactly the same. I mean, obviously, I think the biggest difference in my experience working with same-sex relationships is, um, is around the boundaries. So there may be different ideas of what fidelity means, of course, and what those boundaries might be, uh, but also the issues that, will, um, that, that each of the partners is likely to have as a result of their own journey and their own experience of being um, not being heterosexual, what that means to them, yeah, so minority stress and all that kind of stuff. So also being able to include that in them. How do you work with the uh, partner um, to overcome their resistance to being in recovery in, in terms of the you know the, the attitude of I'm not wrong with the problem. Oh, that's, yeah, I've sussed that one a few years ago, actually. <laughs> it took a while, it just clicked. And we don't offer therapy for partners, and we don't offer counselling for partners, and we don't do therapy groups for partners. We just offer them support. Because they don't need therapy, and they don't need counselling. So we just provide support groups. Okay. And we do some support, individual support sessions. I <laughs> with a trained therapist or counsellor obviously <laughs> and sometimes it's supportive to look at their childhood issues and what's mm -hmm. you know why they're particularly struggling I just don't use those but would they go to a support group yeah well yeah. some outside yeah outside of it, it's the um, what was his name this is not my saying I can't remember who said it but he, somebody a guy in the states said a partner who won't take help is, is a bit like being hit by a bus and refusing to go to A and E because you weren't driving. <laughs> yeah. So I usually say straight away, I don't. I don't suggest they need counselling. I don't suggest they need therapy. But I'm usually like, you know, this. This is huge. You need to get some support for yourself. Some space. Some space. And I'd really like, and if you'd see one of the therapists, just to give you some space to work through this and some support and some help with the trauma. And and generally that, yeah. It's this sales pitch more than anything else. Yeah. Could I ask, um, you know, you spoke about honesty and the 24 hour rule. Yeah. Um, I've worked with a couple of people who have skewed uh, what they've just done all over their partners. Yeah. Uh, every time it happens. And how do you deal with this business of honesty but? Not using the partner who may who who both these people had had told their problem to before I met them, so they're aware of the problem, but kind of trying to use the partners again, bringing them into their addiction. Or yeah, I think you've got to look at what the unconscious process is, is there and why it's being done like that, and that, and actually, you yeah, know, what are the pros and cons to the relationship of this happening, and I think. That, you know that that's always the challenge in couple work is that you you have got you've got um, one partner, the other partner, and the relationship. So uh, my counselling room set up that there's a, a little coffee table between them. So often I will use the coffee table. Sorry, I'm walking away from the camera. Uh, use the coffee table as a metaphor. So we need to look at you know your issues, your issues, and the relationship ones in the middle. And each of you's got a different view of that relationship and how you want that to be some of you are very happy that it's a glass topped table you might prefer different legs you might you might be seeing it as something very different so i can hear you saying that this is beneficial for you but i'm wondering what impact it's having on the coffee table as it were so because you are counseling the relationship as well as the individuals in it there's three components in here and i think one thing i know i haven't said the hardest bit of this of course is getting caught in the drama triangle yeah the victim persecutor rescuer i mean that's tough in any couple work but in this 
it's even harder not to get caught in that because partners so often do feel victimized but also the person with the addiction can go into oh i can't help it it's my addiction they'll go into that powerless victim of my addiction bit and and the she might be rescuing and you've got to watch what's happening there and kind of spell it out so often i've got a picture of the drama triangle up all the time when i'm working with couples if the partner doesn't want to engage it's yeah. very difficult engaging support yes yeah. it's as if she wants to be the therapist yeah yes quite yeah, yeah. it was playing the rescuer yeah. but you have to watch it because that only leaves you the persecutor position yeah. left <laughs> <laughs> sort of slightly sideways I mean obviously you're talking about in general terms a cure to a phenom- phenomenon you yeah. know, out in the world I'm just curious whether you are whether you work on any government groups or bodies that looks into the subjects in a, in a sort of wider no. uh, okay. not yet I'd love to no, I, did, I, I did have a meeting you? with uh, um, to do some lobbying to government around sex and porn addiction and then uh, Brexit, anyone heard of that? Mm. that you know, yeah, things changed. They've got other priorities, it seems. So there was a, yeah. yeah um, this better be the last one, I think. We've had a few situations where the person who's a sex addict, they're acting out was with some, they were officially a straight male, yeah. they're acting out was often uh, with a gay partner. Yeah. I think if you've uh, very common I mean actually there's a whole section in this second edition on working with men who have sex with men and understanding when it is to do with sexual orientation when it is just an escalation of the addiction it's just about variety and it's doesn't matter where you shove shove it you know Um, but I think helping and there is a section in there as well helping partners you, you need to know whether or not what is the are you definitely straight because partners will want to know that yes you're definitely straight how is the partner going to understand that and this is challenging but I also you know being gay is about a hell of a lot more than just where you shove your knob a hell of a lot more orientation is not I mean I think calling it sexual orientation is not helpful sometimes because that makes it all about sex and it's not it's who you want to go shopping with, who you want to spend your life with, who you want to be in an intimate relationship with. And helping partners see that difference is, is often the, the, the turning point that they go, OK, I can. OK, I can get it. You're not gay. And then you've, got, <laughs> then you've still got all the rest of the work to do. <laughs> but it is, yeah. And the psychiatrist working with one of these patients didn't see it as a sex it, it, see, it's, yeah, well, I think that's, that's down to the assessment process of the addiction. I mean, some people with sex addiction have fetish behaviours and some don't. But for a fetish to be part of it, um, I think if something's purely a fetish, a compulsive fetish, you might use a slightly different treatment model. Um, so as a sex therapist, I'm a sex therapist who I've been working with paraphilic behaviours for years and it's not definitely not always addiction. Um, I mean, I'd suggest that that person needs a, a proper assessment and the psychiatrist, who I hope is not in the room, uh, may not have sufficient experience of, of yeah, sex addiction and paraphilic behaviours to know the distinction. Okay, thank you very much everybody. Goodbye, the book.